I talked about getting the 13.8 where we're going to think about how statistics are used to be misguiding pieces of information. What I mean is, you know, in our world, unfortunately, in government, politics, in the marketplaces, people will use a statistic to make you think that they're the better choice, they're the better option, they're the better location to buy things at. For example, here's a graphic source talking about overpopulation in schools. And, you know, which is the best school to go to when it comes to the overpopulation of students per teacher, so on and so forth. And you can look at the two different graphs and you can say, wow, you know, these are pretty close, but this one is way overpopulated compared to this one in the second chart. But interesting enough, they're the exact same data, just showed in different types of graphs. Now they're both bar graphs because they have the spaces between them. Here's the difference. This graph goes from zero up to the seven. So we're talking about zero to 700 students that are located in the school. This one only goes from five up to seven. And the measurements they use go in the halfway point. Now compare the information. I have five and a half in pink, five and a half in pink. I have in blue, six, and I have six. And in green, I go up to seven, and I go up to seven. If all I do is focus in on this chart here and just the top portion of my graph, it looks like, holy cow, these students are so huge in number compared to this school. This must be a really small school. But when I lay it out, truly showing the entire statistics, we go from zero up to the seven, they're all pretty close in range. That interquartile measurement wouldn't be very far apart at all, let alone the regular range. So it's important to understand how statistics are set up. So let's look at the first scenario that we talk about in our book. In this scenario, we have Mr. Owen who's looking for a place to live, but you know he wants it in the average range of the 70s. He wants a comfortable range where he can go out in shorts if he wants to, but he doesn't have to, you know, sweat all the time. And he doesn't have to have a sweater or a jacket on because it's not too cold. And his realtor says, hey, I found a town for you that's going to work perfectly. Here's the statistics of it. And it says the mean or the average temperature is 72 degrees. So you're good to go. Well, if I look at all the information they give me, I need to determine is that a true statement or not. So on below, down below in your book, then, it gives you these thinking questions to process through using that information, the data chart, about that town. And we'll see if that's a true statement or not. What I'm looking for, and that's what I have to first understand, and the question is, is I'm looking for a town that is usually in the 70s. Not in the 80s, not in the 60s, in the 70s. We could have one or two days in the 60s, one or two days in the 80s. We'd be comfortable. Mr. Owen really wants to be in the 70s. I need to look at what then? Well, I gotta look at the statistics in this chart. And in this chart, I'm told the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, the median temperature, and the mean temperature. So this would be for an entire year, the past year, 365 days. I will work backwards from the statistics to draw conclusions about the distribution of data. Well, what does it mean to work backwards? Well, what it means is they didn't give you temperatures for 365 days and make you calculate all this information. They could have, but they said, oh, we'll just give you the answers with these calculators. With that information, then I can go backwards and think about what that must mean and answer these questions then. So in my thinking pathway then that they set up for me, the minimum high temperature is what? So I have to look at my chart and find the minimum high. The minimum high is 62 degrees. All right, so if the minimum is 62 degrees, then the high temperature for the minimum is sometimes less than the 70 I'm looking for. And once again, it's okay if I have a couple of days that are less than 70 degrees. But what's the maximum high temperature? Well, the maximum high temperature is a huge difference. There is a big difference, and I'm sure that all of us are aware, between 72 degrees and 95 degrees. I personally like hot weather. I'm comfortable in 95 degrees. There are some people who are just miserable in 95 degrees. But that temperature is a huge difference. It is greater than the average of the 70s that he's looking for. But when I look at the median, think about what the median actually is. It's 
the center point of all the data. So if it's the center point, then that means I have 50% over here and 50% over here. And what's the median number? The median is 69 degrees. If the median is 69 degrees, then that means at the middle point, 50% of my days, half of 365, so 182 and a half days, is 69 degrees or less colder than what he's looking for. And if half of my days are colder than what he's looking for, that is not a good place for him to live. It does not meet his requirements on what he's looking for. So what we're doing is looking at data sets and thinking about the statistics that were given and do they truly meet the expectations that we're looking for. Another one, we have Ms. Garcia. Ms. Garcia is wanting to go to a car dealership and look at a place that has a large variety of cars and price ranges. She gets data, information from a particular dealership in her town. Is this place gonna be a good place for her to go for what she's looking for. Once again, she's looking for a variety of cars in a wide variety of price ranges. Well, I need to know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for several cars and different price ranges at a dealership. All right, we understand that. What information do I need? I gotta use my statistics that I'm given about that particular dealership. How am I gonna use that information? Well, once again, I'm gonna work backwards with that information but I'm gonna work through it and I'm going to make a box plot. How do I know I'm gonna make a box plot? Because the uh, statistics they give me talk about lower quartiles, upper quartiles, and median prices. So I know if I use my box plot, I'll be able to see what we're talking about. So if I work through that information then, and I look at what they're telling me on my box plot down here, I have my ranges, from a low of 12,000 to a high of 65,000, which is mind boggling to me that anyone would buy a $65,000 car, but I have, in my now 47 years of life, never owned a brand new car, so some people have. Anyway, so with that information, I have my low through my high, and then they give me some specifics about this, these statistics. Now, I'm going to round these down to just the whole numbers. So I'm gonna take the thousands positions off and just look at it as 1250, 55. Why am I doing that? Because that's what my number line has done for me. We've taken off the three zeros and just looked at the first two numbers that we're comparing. That way I don't have to worry about all those zeros on my number line. So I once again on my box plot, start with my lowest number and my highest number. I'm gonna plot my 12 and I'm gonna plot my 65 and mark them on my box plot line. Then I have to find my median. They tell me my median up here is 55,000. That's where all those numbers came from. So I mark my 55. Notice already, if the median is halfway, that we're talking about 50% of these cars are at 55,000 or more. Then I'm going to look at my lower quartile, my upper quartile. So they tell me my lower quartile is 50,000. So I mark the 50. Not a great de deviation from that. And my upper quartile is 60,000, so I marked the 60. So I have my lowest number, my lower quartile, my median, my upper quartile, and my highest number. And then as I work through that, my box plot, I know I make a box connecting lower, median, upper, and then I connect with lines, my lowest number to my highest number. So now that I have my box plot, then I can continue down below it and answer the other questions. So with my box plot then, I'm going to look at the information it gives me. What is my range? What is my interquartile range? What is, or what does, does it match? Excuse me. Does it match what she's looking for, Ms. Garcia is looking for? And then I'm going to explain, because that's what the directions tell me to do. So the range, once again, golf range from zero to wherever it lands, from my highest number to my lowest number, I take 65 minus 10, 65, or excuse me, 12, 65 minus 12 is 53. So I know my overall range is $53,000. My inner quartile range, lower quartile, upper quartile, subtract the two. So I have my 60,000 and my 50,000, when I subtract them, I get 10, which is a 
and for quartile range of $10,000. So the majority of my information was in that $10,000 range. Does this match what we're looking for? Well, what we're looking for, once again, is Ms. Garcia wants a car dealership that has a wide variety of cars for sale at many different price ranges. No, this does not meet her requirements. So that answer doesn't match, and how do I know? Well, there's a wide range of prices. When I look at my range, it's a price range of $53,000. The inner quartile shows us that the price cluster, though, has are all more closer to that higher end. I could say that my median tells me that half of them are between fifty-five and sixty-five thousand dollars, and only half of them are from fifty-five down to ten thousand. So, what closer that is, the majority of the information is in that box for the box plot, that quartile range. It's not a very good place for her to go if she truly wants a wide variety of prices. All right, so let's look at the share and show problems that they give us. We have Josh. Josh is playing a game at the carnival. He has tickets, but he's going to be very picky about what games he's going to spend his tickets on. It says, in this particular game, if his arrow lands on a section mark 25 or higher, he gets a prize. Josh will only play, this is his stipulation, if most of the players win a prize. The carnival worker says that the average, or the mean, score is 28. The box plot shows other statistics about this game. Should Josh play the game, explain your reasoning. So I'm going to take you through the thinking pattern. First, I'm going to look at the median. The median is what? The median is 20. That's what it shows me right there. Okay. So then it says next. Work backwards from the statistics. The median is the, well, median means middle, so it's the middle value of the data. So at least blank of the values, well, the median is middle, so we know at least half of those values, 50% of them, are scores less than or equal to, less than or equal to that 20. And what did he say? He said that he's going to, if people win, at least half of the people win. And in order to win, they have to have 25. Are they going to win? So finally use the statistics to draw your conclusions. If I can draw my conclusions, use those statistics. Now, Josh really shouldn't play that, right? Because if he wants at least half the people to win, and you have to get a 25 in order to win, and half of the people get 20 or less, it does not meet what he's wanting. Half of the players of the game score 20 or less, so most players do not win. You should not participate with that game. But they say, what if? So think then, if we change the statistics, a score of 15 or greater instead of 25 or greater, 15 or greater is what gets you a prize. How would that affect Josh's decision? And you will explain. Well, if I change it to 15 or more, and the majority of the people get 20 or higher, then that's going to meet Josh's requirements. So where Josh wouldn't play this game, down here, since 15 is the lower quartile, and I know all everyone else, this larger grouping is going to get more than the game would meet Josh's requirements. So he should play. Make sure you fill in your book. Make sure you're following along. One more. A store collects data on the sales of DVD players. Each week for three months, the manager determines that the data has a range of 62 players and decides that the weekly sales were very inconsistent. Use the statistics in the table to decide if the manager is correct and then explain. Why is it correct? Well, we have to go through the information, right? We have a minimum, we have a maximum, we have a lower quartile and an upper quartile. So as we work through it, when we start thinking about just what that information is telling us, is it inconsistent? Look at the lower and the upper quartiles, between 72 and 58. Well, 72 to 58, that's actually a very small range. 
compared to the minimum. We just had an off week or maybe two off weeks where we sold very few. But the inner quartile range tells me we're very close together within, you know, a few of selling each other. So the range of 62 DVD players from how few we sold to how many we sold and the inner quartile is only a difference of 14 players. The range is affected by the lowest, the 16. It's that, you know, outlier, that one crazy week that, you know, maybe people just weren't in the mood for shopping. So the manager isn't right there. He, he's looking at the wrong statistics. We should look at that inner quartile and see well, most of our weeks, how are we doing in our sales of DVD players? Uh, well, we're staying consistent and only 14 players apart from each other. Yeah, that's pretty consistent. Well, then we're going to look at this question because it has nothing to do with what we've been doing, but it's a review just in case we have something like this on our home. Gerard is fencing in a yard that is 21 feet by 18 feet. How many, how many yards of fencing material does Gerard need? Explain how you found your answer. So our measurements are in what? And what are we looking for? So we're in measurements of feet, and I'm looking for yards. So this takes us back to chapter uh, 12 when we change our measurements. So I know if I would draw my rectangle, which you're always more than welcome to draw your rectangles to help you, and I show my measurements of 21 and 18, I know my formula, or I should know that my formula for perimeter by now, distance all the way around the shape, is just adding the side plus the side plus the side plus the side. If, there were, if it was a pentagon, I'd add five sides. If it was a hexagon, I'd add six sides, so on and so forth. But I have to be able to change it into feet or into yards from the feet because that's what it's asking me to do. So that's where we're going to switch over. Now, we're going to get into Chapter 6 after this lesson and our next test. And we're going to be looking on how we do all of these things. So this is an introduction of what's coming next. And that's why you're going to need Book 1 because it, Chapter 6 is at the end of Book 1. So when I look at it, I should know that for every three feet, I have one yard. If you don't know that, then listen. For every three feet, I have one yard. No, you're not. So if I know that every three feet is one yard and I'm changing it into yards, then I got to take the feet that I have and divide them by the three, figure out how many yards I have. So I'm going to take my 21 and divide by three. That tells me that I need to change that to a seven. And then I take my 18 and divide it by three. And that tells me that I need to change it to a six. So my sides, I have a top and a bottom that are going to be seven. I have a left and a right that are going to be six. When I add those together, my two sevens and my two sixes, seven and seven is 14, six and six is 12. 14 plus 12 is 26. Or I could write it out and then type in my handy dandy calculator, seven plus seven plus seven plus six equals, and I'm going to get 26 yards. So how much fencing does he need? He needs 26 yards of fencing. Using the how did I do it, start, sorry, explain how you found your answer. I used my formula for perimeter, and I simply solved my perimeter by changing it to yards. That is, oh, no, sorry, we have one more. Forgot about this question. So I'm going to talk about fish, and I'm going to talk about stamps. So I'm going to pause here and there, and I want you to think about what it's asking and for you to work it out. So Susanna wants to buy a fish that grows to be about four inches long. Mark suggests that she buys the same type of fish that he has. He has five of these fish with lengths that are one inch, one inch, six, six, and six. That gives them a mean, statistically, of a length of four inches, which is what she wants. Should Susanna buy his type of fish? And explain, yes, he should, or she should, or no, she should not. So think about what it says. Pause the video. Think about it. And then before you write it down, just check to see if your thinking is correct or not. So stop the video. Think about what it says. And answer in your mind, yes or no, and give me a reason. Hopefully you have an answer in your head. So we have five different fish. He has a mean, mathematically, when he adds them all together and divides by five, of four, and she says she wants fish that are four inches. 
Is that a good source for her to use on the measurements? It is not a good source at all. I'm not going to go in and invest in those fish because some fish will continue to grow to the size of their tank. Goldfish will get huge. You can put a goldfish and just continue to move tanks and it'll just continue to grow bigger and bigger. Some fish will only grow to be a certain size. So that's not a good measurement. Even though the mean is four inches, none of his fish are four inches. They're either bigger or they're a lot smaller. So it doesn't meet the requirements that she set up for her question. So now let's look at this one. The graph shows the number of stamps that Luciana collected over several weeks. If the pattern continues, so there, they tell us there's a pattern there, how many stamps will Luciana collect in, in week eight and explain your answer? So I want you to think about it, mark it down, and get a scrap piece of paper, pause it, and then once you have an answer, you have an explanation, unpause the video, and we'll check out your answer. So hopefully you have an answer and an explanation like I asked. Okay. So we have to figure out what the pattern is. And when I look at it, if I start with just my odd number of weeks, one, three, five, then that would take me to week seven. Is there a pattern there? Well, my values go from one to three to, no, excuse me, one to two to three one, two, three, so then that tells me that my next week, my next odd week would be what? It'd be four, right? So my pattern there is that I'm increasing by one each odd week. What about my evens? If I look at my evens then, I'm starting at three, and then I increase to four, and then I increase to five. So on my even number of weeks, I'm starting higher but I'm still increasing by one each time. So if I'm increasing by one on my odds, I'm increasing by one on my evens, I need to figure out what eight is gonna be equal to. So I can either fill in the next two boxes, or I can just fill in the eighth one by following the pattern on the even numbers. If I do both boxes, then my seventh week, I know I would go up from the three by one and get a four. And then on my eighth, I would go up from the five by one and get six. Or I could just follow the pattern for my even numbers, which is what eight, week eight is, it's an even number, and just increase from my five to my six. Either way, I'm gonna find out that through the patterns, there would be six collected in the eighth week. Since the pattern alternates every other two, in week eight, he would collect six eight. So every two weeks, it alternates. We increase by one. He's going to end up with six stamps that he collects in the eighth week of his collection. The data set shows the number of hours that Luke plays the piano each week. Luke says, he's presenting this idea. Now, Luke, watch yourself on this because we're going to find out if you're telling the truth or not. He usually plays the piano three hours per week. Why is Luke's statement misleading? Well, if I look at the information and I put my numbers in order from least to greatest, well, I wouldn't even have to do that because he says my average is. Well, what is my average? Well, he usually plays my mean, my average. I'm going to add them all together. I'm telling you that's equal to 21, and there's seven days in a week, so I divide by seven. I do get an average of three. But does he usually play that amount? Well, let's see. If the mean is three but I put them in order from least to greatest, and I start looking at it, the mean is three, but I had an outlier of practicing 10 hours one day to where all the other days are pretty small. Because from my median, I have one, two, three, four, five out of the seven days that do not show that he practices at least three hours a day. Shame on you, Luke, you shouldn't have lied to us. So the mean is three, however, five of the days are less than three, the three that he claims. So it is a misleading statement. So statistics can be used consistently to misguide us, mislead us, and give us false direction. So we have to look at the numbers that we're given, be able to move them around mathematically to see what the true relationship is. So we have two, three, four, five, six, five questions, and five on the back. So I have 10 questions. Once again, the five on the front and the first two, are going to be over this B 
being able to understand the information that's given and seeing if something is a true statement or a false statement. And then I have the last three that are going to be review over things that we have done. Once again, this is going to be the end of chapter 13. The next two days we're going to be working on our math test. And then you need to have book one. So make sure you know where it is and bring it back to class because we're going to get into book one and we're going to do all of chapter six before we start into our review section for the rest of the year.